Find other great podcasts like this one at podmoth.network. Welcome to the Brutal, Bizarre, and Boozy podcast. I'm Declan, the son. And I'm Jane, the mom. This is the podcast where we talk about brutal crimes, bizarre occurrences, and get you drunk with cocktails themed around one of our stories. To lighten things up, we'd like to end our time with a chaser. Please keep in mind some of our stories might be upsetting to young or sensitive ears. We love hearing from our listeners, so feel free to contact us by email or social media. You can find our contact info in the show notes for this episode. If you'd like to support us through Patreon, you can find us there at Brutal, Bizarre, and Boozy Podcast, or use the link in our show notes. Working can be such a drag, but it's a necessary evil. What better way to combat the woes of the working world than to commiserate with your fellow man? I'm Jay. And I'm Kay. And we're the hosts of Fuck My Work Life, a comedy podcast where we share people's stories from the workplace. Whether they're funny, weird, scary, or just plain messed up, they're always entertaining and may leave you thinking you don't have it so bad after all. Available on all major podcast platforms. Give us a listen. Your sanity may just depend on it. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us again today. We're so excited because we have some friends that came to hang out with us for this podcast. Um, we have Amanda and David from the One Nothing podcast um, and also David from Down the Rabbit Hole. So if you guys want to say hey and uh, tell us about yourselves, that'd be awesome. Hey, I'm Amanda <laughs> with One Nothing Podcast, my fabulous co-host over here, co-host with the co-most, I call him. Um, That's me. Yeah, we run One Nothing Podcast together, and um, we have a third co-host, co-host who comes in um, do we? kind of on a rotating basis. Do we? Have we do. Um, <laughs> but we talk Stay. about lots of different kinds of true crime and, and strange fatalities of people dying in mysterious and strange ways. Yeah, yes. I think... Your um the horse story was Ugh. the one that hit me the hardest Aww. when you were telling that. I was like, not that I'm not a horse person. I don't know anything about horses. Just the whole like hyperbaric chamber thing. Just yeah. and then it, oh, not no spoilers. But if you guys haven't listened to it, go listen to it. It will traumatize you the way it traumatized me. Let's all yes. share the trauma. Makes it's it less. It's for sure an explosive. <laughs> it's explosive. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. Cool. Oh. Yeah. Thank you for that. For that shout out. That's that was a. Uh, I don't. I don't like to say they're ever fun to do, but when you learn about people who aren't talked about anywhere, you know, I couldn't find any other podcast on her, so that was kind of cool to right to do that. Yeah. Such an amazing and wild story, and extremely tragic and sad. So. Yeah, unfortunately. Yes. So, David, how, you did you guys, how did you guys? How did you guys get together for the podcast? I've always been curious about that story. So i uh, I have a paranormal page on Instagram, Facebook, X, Trends, TikTok, you name it, and um, my uh, my page started to grow. It's pretty big now. It's like eighty thousand. And Woo-hoo. sometime I would say a year has it been a year now, Amanda, something like that, right? Yeah. We're so a year over, ago, I think now. a friend of mine said, "Hey, can you support the Paranormal Project? It's, I'm doing this. Uh, it's a show with three other podcasters. Please listen." So I was like, "All right." At the time, I, I had not done one podcast at all. I was not even a guest on a podcast, and I was not like, "This is not my thing," but I'll listen for you. And so it was, there was four stories being told and I happened to catch Amanda's story and she was covering the Stardust Ranch, very close to Skinwalker Ranch. And the amount of detail and research that she put into it was just awesome. I was like totally engrossed in her story. She even had like interviews with the people. It was great. And I had not heard this story, so it really blew my mind. So I went and I looked for her, 
And I started, I listened to the first episode and I was hooked on the first episode. And I reached out as a fan. I was, I was fanboying and saying, Hey, you did a great job. <laughs> and we just started, you know, we, we hit it off. We started talking about stuff and, you know, it pretty much grew from there. We're best friends. She's my best friend in the whole wide world. Aww. And, uh, yeah, the whole world. it just seems to work. It's like we have a good chemistry going and, you know, with her tutelage, I have grown in the podcasting world. So thank you, my dear. My tutelage? Is that what you just said? Your tutelage. Your tutelage. You tutled me. <laughs> Did you not? That's awesome. Tutelage. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My well, yes. Declan, do you want to tell us what story you're going to tell today? I'm going to be talking. I have... I couldn't really find much information on this other than interviews. So this is a, I think it's one that no one's heard of yet. Oh, it's Sweet. Pamela and Reno. Ooh. Pamela I, yes. Well, it's I a brutal that story, name so. doesn't ring a bell. So <laughs> that's exciting. Is my microphone not working? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I wasn't seeing my voice thing on the bottom. I'm sorry. You sound very sassy. <laughs> <laughs> sassy we like sassy what gonna, here <laughs> what are you gonna be telling us about mom um so this is inspired by um a couple weeks ago we were doing a recording for um our patreon and we were talking about i don't even know if you remember it i feel like it was kind of one of those things where we sometimes talk and i'm i because we talk so often that we have mm. these conversations that I'm like, when did we have that conversation? Um, but we were talking about faking your own death. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's a hot and topic. so I went looking for a story about that and I found one, a pretty good one, I think. So um, I'm going to be telling you about that. And to go with the story, I um, brought the Moonlight Miami Mule, which Ooh. is three quarters of an ounce of Hawaiian coconut syrup, one and a half ounce of vanilla vodka, the juice of half of a lime, and four ounces of ginger beer. The steps are to squeeze the juice of the lime into the bottom of a copper mug, top with um, coconut syrup and vanilla vodka then fill the mug with ice and top with ginger beer stir and garnish with a lime so full disclosure I could not find coconut syrup and frankly what? didn't have any desire to go to every store in town looking for it so I decided to use Coco Lopez instead, which I Ooh. thought it's probably it's the, the same. same. It's sweet. Yeah. It's coconut. Probably pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll get an idea if it's good or not. But let's is that give Coco it. Jennifer Lopez? Is that what's going on? I suppose it could be, depending on who's buying it. All right, I'm giving it a try. All right. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 Oh. I don't hate that. I'm not a huge fan of that. I didn't think you would be, but no, I love vanilla I, vodka, no. and I'm I a big fan vodka. of coconut. <laughs> so, I think so, my lime was bigger than your guys's. It's very limey. <laughs> it's spicy. Yeah, I it's like it. Spicy. Too. Why is it it's not spicy? bad though? I don't like it. <laughs> it's the Lopez. No, I wouldn't. Sure. It wouldn't be my go-to to order at a bar. <laughs> But it's not fair. I could finish this glass and, and probably not. Yeah, I'll finish this glass, probably. but I don't know that. I'll finish mine too, but I just don't like it very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't think that I would because of the ginger more. beer. Yeah, no. I like ginger beer. So I'm a fan. I like it. It's good. Okay. I found ourselves a new drink. drink. Look at that. Yeah, I like it when that happens. I don't like it when we have the ones that I'm like, nope, I can't even finish this. This is a terrible i was a little worried this might be one of those for me because i'm typically not a ginger beer fan but this is it's not bad the the vanilla kind of dulls it a little yeah 
I don't I don't know about the aftertaste. It's this would not be the drink I would have as my last drink on earth. No. Yeah. No. no. Not the last drink. I would nice. agree. It wouldn't be my pick for the last drink, but it's not mm-hmm. terrible. It is not terrible. You are right, Jane. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so my story is about John Stonehouse. He was born in um, July 1925 in Southampton, England. He was the youngest of four children to William and Rosina Stonehouse. John was interested in politics when he was young and joined the Labor Party when he was 16 years old. So I admit, because this is in the UK, I don't know a lot about like the political stuff there. And to be honest, didn't really feel like I needed to jump head into researching all about the political stuff in the UK. There's different parties and he was in the Labour Party. And he joined at 16, which I could have cared less about politics when I was 16, but that's me. True. Yeah. (laughs) And in fact, I (laughs) kind of care less about politics now. So so he joined when he was 16. He might have gotten this interest from his mother because she was the mayor of their town and also a city council member for over 30 years. The Labour Party is a political party in the U.K., It is usually described as an alliance of socialist Democrats, trade unionists, and democratic socialists, which, again, a lot of words about political stuff that I know nothing about. (laughs) After college, he served on the Royal Air Force as a pilot from 1944 to 1946. Once his military service was complete, he went back to school at London School of Economics, where he was studying for a degree in economics. John was still focused on politics, and his classmates recalled that he often spoke about the best way to get a seat on Parliament. He married his wife, Barbara, in 1948, and the couple went on to have three children. He first became a member of Parliament in 1957, where he served until the position was abolished in 1974. However, he wasn't out of a job. He just switched to a different seat position. So basically, he was a member of parliament in like one district and then they decided to get rid of that district and he just moved to a different one. Okay. So it wasn't a big deal. It's going to get a big deal in a little bit, but I was going to say, was, cause like spend your whole life working for parliament and then they're like, Hey, your position doesn't exist anymore. Like that would kind of suck. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. He just moved over, which is, you know, kind of nice. He was a noteworthy member of parliament, and many people thought that he might be on track to becoming prime minister one day. One of the actions he did in his early days in parliament was to form a twin city agreement for his town, Wensbury, and it was uh, basically a twin city with a town in Czechoslovakia uh, known as Kladno. I could be pronouncing that completely wrong, but it's a guess. Um, Both towns were industrial-based towns, so the agreement seemed appropriate. The act of twinning two towns is also referred to as sister cities and is um, done between two geographically separate locations for the purpose of developing cultural and commercial ties. Basically like a goodwill concept between the two cities so that they have, you know, some general, you know, community together. Um, I remember hearing about like sister cities a lot when I was younger. I don't know yeah. that I've heard anybody talking about anything like that. If it's even something that is still done. Yeah, I can't say. I know well, I grew up in Canada and we had sister cities, but I don't know if that may be like the same kind of deal or separate, but mm-hmm. I don't ever remember hearing anything about it here. Like everywhere I've lived, I've never heard any place referred to as our sister city. 
Where in Canada? We have a sister city with Japan. Hamilton, Ontario. Japan? Ontario. We have, yeah, San Antonio. Not Japan. San Antonio has a sister city with uh, Japan. I couldn't tell you the name. I can't remember. I think we also have a sister city in Mexico. And they, not too recent, gave us a like a huge red statue. It's kind of nice downtown. It looks really nice. Okay. Nice. So they're still yeah. trying to keep the sister city community thing going. Okay. That's I cool. So, yeah. That's cool. Mm-hmm. San Antonio has a big family if they've got all these different sister cities in different countries, though. Mm. Oh, yeah. You fancy. Yeah. (laughs) Shortly after getting his first position with Parliament, some believe he was recruited by the Czech government to spy for them. In 1969, the prime minister asked John about accusations of spying for the Czech government. Apparently, they had information from a Czechoslovakian defector who had worked for the Czech secret police. This agent claimed that he had directly worked with John, but John denied it all, and there didn't appear to be any evidence of him being a spy. Some believed he he provided the communist Czech government with information about the UK for many years. However, the evidence of him being a spy has been hotly debated for years, especially by his daughter, Julia. She claims there is no conclusive evidence that he was actually a spy and that the information regarding spying activities can't be believed due to the sources, who she claims are notoriously untrustworthy. So she wrote a book about him, and she specifically denied in that book that he was ever a spy, that he ever did any spying activities for the Czech government. There's other authors who um, have written books, including his nephew wrote a book, and his nephew did say in his book that, yes, John was a spy, and there's evidence of it, but these two people are just constantly fighting back and forth, and Julia says that the nephew is making shit up, and he's like, she's just trying to minimize what her dad did, and regardless, there's been some contention over whether or not he actually spied um however um if he was a spy it doesn't look like he had access to or even gave them any important information so if he was spying or spying (laughs) (laughs) maybe he was like okay i'll spy for you but i'm just gonna tell you like when the trash gets picked up (laughs) <laughs> in my neighborhood or something they're like okay why would we care i don't know um it's definitely something to think about when looking at the rest of his life and his career but whether or not he was a spy he did travel to czechoslovakia um frequently on a regular basis but he also traveled to other countries in europe so you know it was kind of his job to just travel around so whether or not he was in Sounds Czechoslovakia nice. and that maybe he was a spy, I don't know. Hmm. Um, in 19, um, when he was accused of it, there wasn't enough evidence for them to do anything. So he remembered him. He remained a member of parliament. They didn't kick him out of his job or anything. They were just like, okay, well, we think that maybe we heard that you did this but if you are knock it off i guess um oh, but he didn't lose his job just a however slap on the old wrist there right in 1970 <laughs> he did lose a position in the shadow cabinet again i don't know what the, all that means but he lost a position which meant he lost a decent amount of his income so mm-hmm. i looked up what a shadow cabinet was and it kind of sounded like they a point these people that have to like go watch all of like what the other party is doing to see how they can counteract it or something i don't know our uk listeners maybe they can tell me what it all means if i you know murdered it and said bad things about it but is it like beyond the shadows cabinet is that what's going on i don't think so But maybe it could be. Either way, 
he lost that position and he lost the income from it. So, and it was a substantial amount of income apparently. So he decided to rely and go back to his economics background from his college years. And he was going to supplement his parliament income in the business world. He established several businesses around the world, including an investment bank in Bangladesh. I want to know how you just decide to start a bank in another country. Like, doesn't it Not take like money, an absurd amount of money that he wouldn't have had having mm -hmm. reduced that position? I would think you would need a lot of money to just go, I'm going to open a bank. Yeah. So Unless like your first you spy for like, I'll take five hundred dollars. You're like, oh, I didn't think that far. That's kind of right. So oh yeah, like he's spying. Strange. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Maybe I should mm -hmm. be a spy and start opening banks in other countries. Seems anyway, probable. Awesome. <laughs> um, however, none of his business ventures really panned out. So oh. it's believed that he was in debt over 800,000 pounds by 1974, which would be over 15 million pounds in today's money. And for us Ouch. U.S. people, that's about 19 and a half million dollars. Holy Ouch. Shit. That's that which I don't know how you get into debt 19 and a half million dollars and but no kidding. And people get waxed for less too. Another country might do that. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get whacked for any debt. No. Thank you. <laughs> Besides his overwhelming amount of debt, John had another problem. He was having an affair with his secretary, mm. Sheila Buckley, mm. and apparently mm. they were in love. So with his finances in ruin and tired of hiding his relationship with Sheila from his wife, because he's still married um, and has a family, which he's hiding his relationship uh, from his wife and family, he made a decision to change his life. What is a great way to change your life? Well, in John's opinion, it was to die. But you don't want to actually die if you're in love with your mistress. So you just figure out how to fake your death. Oh, it sounds a lot easier than it actually is, I bet. <laughs> I mean, well, you got to give him props that he didn't murder his family because that's the way most people do it. So, like, right. good that's point. the way Americans do it. And, like, good not your point. family. <laughs> Can't even be mad I the like guy. the UK take on that. Just <laughs> mm -hmm. fake your own death and don't kill the rest of your family because yeah. that's rest. not yeah. cool. So there are no guns in the UK. Did he use a mm -hmm. knife to end it all? No. So this is where our drink is, is going to come into play. Mm -hmm. So in November 1974, he went on a work trip to Florida. He left his clothes on the beach and walked into the ocean for a swim, then disappeared. When what? he didn't return, wow. it was assumed that he went on a swim and died in the ocean, either by drowning or being eaten by a shark. That's pretty smart, like that. That's just assumed because That's nobody saw him smart. come back to shore, like, must have died out there, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, his <laughs> clothes are here. So, I mean... Apparently, he was on this trip with a coworker, and he told the coworker, "I'm going for a swim." And when he didn't come back, the coworker was like, "John didn't come back, and his clothes are on the beach. I guess he died in the water." Yeah, so mm. ironic for a man who's twenty bajillion dollars in debt. How strange. right? I can't even imagine why that would be. So, because he's so heavily in debt, some thought that he had committed suicide including his wife, Barbara. A few weeks after John went missing from the Florida beach, a bank teller in Australia noticed something odd with some money that had been deposited. The teller at the Bank of New Zealand had processed a large cash deposit from a British man named Clive Muldoon. For some reason, the teller thought something was odd. He learned that the money had come from a different bank, like just down the road, the Bank of New South Wales. 
but the owner of that account was named Joe Markham. Hmm. Thinking the situation was alarming, the teller notified the police. Also in the news around the time of John's death was the disappearance of Lord Lucan. Lord Lucan was believed to be involved in the death of his children's nanny and in a and the attempted murder of his wife, which I didn't really look into this because I think I want to do it on a future episode because it sounds pretty interesting. And I would like to know if they ever found this guy, Lord Lucan. Um, But when the Australian police were notified of the strange bank transactions done by a British man, they believed that they had finally found Lord Lucan because it was all around the same time. Lord Lucan disappeared like weeks before John did. And he's believed to have been the murderer of the nanny and attempted murder of his wife. So they're looking for him, but he's nowhere to be found. And they're like, oh, there's this British guy doing weird shady shit in Australia. It's hmm. got to be Lord Lucan because John's dead. He got eaten by a <laughs> shark. Allegedly. Allegedly. (laughs) In an effort to positively identify him, um, the police detained the British man, who, again, they thought to be Lord Lucan. And, you know, because it's 1974, they don't really know about, okay, fingerprints were known, DNA is not really known, but they... Their method of identification on the spot was to tell him to pull his, okay, I've seen two different descriptions. Either pull his pants down or pull his pant leg up because apparently Lord Lucan had a large scar on the inside of his thigh. So when they asked him to expose his leg, there was no scar and they went, oh, it's not Lord Lucan. When there was no scar, they realized it wasn't Lucan, and they eventually learned that they actually had detained John Stonehouse, who wasn't dead after all, because he had just faked his death to start a new life with his girlfriend. He had been mm-hmm. gone for almost a month, which is not that long. No, I was thinking it was going to be a few years, but he only got a month out of that deal? No, he only got a month out of his faked mm-hmm. death slash He's like a pretty shitty spy if he can't even stay out of the limelight in his new life. (laughs) Right? Not the the brightest guy, huh? That's a shame. No. He's just like telling everyone at the grocery store, like, yeah, man, listen to what I used to do. (laughs) Right. He was eventually extradited back to the UK to stand trial for 21 counts of fraud, theft, forgery, conspiracy to defraud, causing a false police investigation. And I did not know that this was a true... Um, charge over there but wasting police time apparently was another charge that he got he was released on bail nearly eight months after being arrested in Australia he didn't immediately resign his position with parliament but continued for almost two years so what wait what wait he died came back to life and still had a job his job Yep. (laughs) And died, came back to life, went to jail, (laughs) sitting in jail, and still Still had his job. job. He was making decisions from jail? Yeah. (laughs) What the hell? Yeah. He was convicted in August 1976 for fraud and sentenced to seven years in prison. That was when he finally resigned from parliament. So he sat in jail for a while awaiting the completion of his trial and then when he was convicted he was like, "Okay, I guess I have to resign now." While in prison, Why? John and Barbara got divorced. <laughs> he also started having some health issues including a couple of heart attacks. He was released from prison in 1979 for good behavior after serving just 3 years. Wow. He and his mistress Sheila were married in 1981. And oh the my god. Had- yeah. She stuck by him. Yep. They had one child together. He wasn't out of the limelight, though, as he wrote three novels and made numerous TV and radio appearances. Most of these interviews surrounded his life and faked death. And in 1988, he suffered another heart attack that was considered mild. But then a few weeks later, he had a massive heart attack that caused his actual death. 
there was no faking at this time. <laughs> so <laughs> don't you believe you it? Sure? He's still out there. Right. He could be. He's he out there. Be. Tell me. Did he ever explain how, like, what happened after he walked into the ocean? Did he swim to, like, another part of the uh, – how did he get away? Yeah, I think he swam to, like, a different beach and crawled out, basically. Oh, okay. In the nude, much less. Yeah. Yeah. Or his girlfriend had, had a boat out there. Could be. For him to get yeah. Out. Maybe. Yeah, yeah I want to hear from Barbara about this. Like, Let's drive to New Zealand. He died and then found out that he was alive and well and with another chick somewhere else. Like, Damn. For a month, she thought he was dead. Yeah. She thought he committed suicide. I wonder if she got left alone his debt. Like if they transferred it somehow oh. to her and were like, you have to pay back this $19 million. I Bounce did up. hear. Oh, um, Andy, now you owe us money. Oh, right. And now you have $20 million <laughs> in his debt. Um, I did hear something about that he had taken out some good life insurance policies on himself because he didn't want to leave her with all those debts. I don't know if it was enough to cover his $20 million in debt, but. Such a thoughtful scumbag. So nice. Right? It's like, well, I can't just leave her high and dry if I'm going to run off with my mistress. Oh, man. John, John. Crazy. All right, are you guys ready for my story? I am. Yes. Hit it. Okay. So Pamela Anarino was a 47-year-old living in Ohio, and most people she interacted with liked her. Pam was a former sheriff deputy in the county she lived in and primarily worked in the county jail. Pam liked to look for the best in people, and while at work, she met a man named Philip Elmore. Philip was one of those people who were constantly in and out of jail for like a couple months, like small theft charges and things like that, uh, which is how they met because she was working and started chatting him up. Oh. And a few months after Philip was released, he and Pam started dating. Of course they did. Yes, I had a feeling it yes. was going to go there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. True love. However, they didn't get along as well after a few months, and Pam decided to end the relationship. Philip didn't really want to break up and had multiple episodes of threatening Pam and showing up at her house uninvited. Oh, girl. Not nice. Make better choices. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy to come over and threaten a sheriff deputy. <laughs> like, yeah. It's crazy to be a sheriff deputy and be like, hi, this guy who's like away from the, the general public for safety. Let me yeah. <laughs> Don't be a sheriff's deputy and date your inmates. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least at and, least they waited until after he got out. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. you don't know what was going on while the, he was still in. Did right, they, right. Did right. they? Did right. they really? Right. That's just what they tell everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> In June of 2002, Pam's son was getting married. Pam's sister picked her up on the day of the wedding and drove her to the church. After the wedding, Pam stopped by her house to pick up her car and drove herself to the reception. Pam didn't go inside the house at this time because her car was parked in the driveway. Pam got in her Camry and drove to the reception. At about 6 o'clock, she leaves the reception and goes home. A few days after the wedding, several uh, family members tried calling Pam to meet up for a meal, but were surprised when she didn't answer, which was fairly unusual for her. She usually, she didn't pick up the phone right away. She'd call you back fairly quickly. About three days after the wedding, Pam's brother-in-law and best friend decided to stop by the house and check on her. Oh, I don't like where this the, is going. Yeah. Just wait. (laughs) Three days. I really don't like where this is going. They knocked on the window with no answer, so they walked around the house to see if anything bad might have happened. Inside, they saw Pam's dog, which is a little strange because Pam brought her dog almost everywhere. Mm. The brother-in-law decided to bust open a window and look inside. They yelled for Pam once they got inside, again with no answer, so they just walked around and 
checked out the house. Everything looked normal until they made it upstairs. This is where they found Pam's body. Mm, I knew it. Yeah. They I called mean, the police we and knew it was left the house. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of given in the, right, <laughs> in the story. Uh, they left the house not to disturb the crime scene. And when police arrived, they found Pam with a pair of leggings tied around her throat and her head had been bashed in. Oh, yeah. Damn. As police conducted their investigation, they noticed the back door lock had been taken apart from the outside somehow and the lock plate was missing. So like the little piece that goes on the the door jam to keep the yeah. lock in place when it's closed, that part was missing. Oh. Which will come up later. I don't know how they you do discovered... that from the outside. That's terrifying. The That's thought that somebody crappy, could do yeah. that from the I outside. <laughs> I don't know how. It was... I don't like that. They also discovered a sleeping bag and other little necessities in Pam's garage. Like a sleeping bag <gasps> laid out that someone had been sleeping in. Wow. So, oh. Hold my question. Yeah. Yuck. Police spoke with the neighbor who told them that Pam, they saw Pam go inside after the reception. But a few hours later, Philip Elmore, the man she used to date, mm -hmm. came from inside the house, got in Pam's car, and drove away. They didn't see him get out of the car with her after the reception. Her. They just right. saw him leave. Okay. So he'd been in there after, for a bit. He was in there, yeah. Yeah. After this information uh, was given to the police, an APB was put out for her car, which was found a few days later. However, Elmore wasn't driving it at the time. There was two people in the car, and one of the passengers said that it belonged to someone she was living with. So the police went to her home where they found Philip and arrested him. Hmm. When they searched him, they found the missing lock face in his pocket, which oh. is weird that he was just holding it. Onto oh, it for several so days. A trophy. Why would you it do a trophy. that? Yeah. It's a trophy. Super weird. I'm a not smart fella. Declan, what was he arrested on originally? Uh, the suspicion that the stolen car. No, oh, like but I mean, like before the very when first he was... time. Originally. Yeah. Oh, I I couldn't find any information on that. He he got a bunch of like theft. Crime. So it's oh, okay. I think it's theft. Petty wow. theft. Yeah. So uh, he gave his confession later that day, and according to Philip, he broke into the garage and was staying in there for a while. Once she left for the wedding, he pried open the door and proceeded to grab Pam's shotgun from under her bed. When she returned home, he confronted her with the shotgun. The two talked and argued for a while, while Philip reportedly gave the shotgun to Pam and told her, if you want to kill me, then just do it. Oh, girl, you should. Pam went upstairs with the shotgun and continued arguing. Philip went downstairs, grabbed a lead pipe that he had brought in when he broke in, and went upstairs again. Mm. He hit Pam in the arm with the pipe. She fell into the bathtub, and he proceeded to hit her four to five times in the head with the pipe. Oh. He then took her purse, left the house, locked the door, and stole her car. Philip was given the death penalty for this, and in 2006, he tried to appeal the death penalty by saying there wasn't enough smoke breaks, and it caused a, <laughs> a mistrial. What? Yeah. This was denied because only one juror for his trial smoked. <laughs> so, he's sitting on the death penalty in Ohio right now. So oh his his line my. of thinking was that his jury was just like, oh, I just really want to smoke right now. Let's just vote him guilty because yeah, so, we're mad. Like that's what he thought it was. The, that's what making sure. That's what he filed Good. his appeal as. Yeah. Lord. Oh, Lord. So Talk bad. about Please. grasping at straws. Yeah. Oh wow. So was he? Did he? Like, his lawyer. His lawyer's probably like, you really want me to submit this? Are you right? sure? <laughs> no kidding. So did they detail, like, the sleeping bag found in the garage? Was he, like, living in her house or something? Like, sleeping there waiting for her? Or did he, he set that up after he killed her? there for that day. 
Okay. He wasn't like living there, but he was there from Who the morning a sleeping bag of the wedding. Day trip? <laughs> yeah, maybe it was chilly in there. So like, <laughs> well, I guess it was. Yeah, June. that's true. It probably wouldn't be. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe... You never know. I don't know what the weather's like in Ohio, but June Not here great. it could be cold. I don't it does know. I, I randomly hail in June. <laughs> yeah, I mean we've gotten Almost snow in July that's... here, so. Yeah. Oh. Yes, that is the story of Pam and Reno. I it's do really wonder, like, how did he? I could see from inside being able to undo the lock, but how do you get it from the outside? So when you say lock face, are you meaning like the little thing with the keyhole? Like he took that? No, it's the part that goes on the door jam that the bolt slides into. Oh, that into like the thing goes is... in and out of to lock it? Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah how he would he get that. that from that side? I have no idea. It, he didn't it seems like really he was describe a, how a, he did it. A skilled thief. So he probably yeah. had his methods. So his yeah, neighbor's wow. seeing him coming and going out of into a vehicle, but can't watch some guy stand outside for two hours and try to take a lock off. That's yeah. Really yeah. Cool. It was in the backyard, so maybe it was harder for the neighbors to see, but... Good point. I wonder if he, like, that? picked the lock oh, and then didn't want to pick it again, so he, like, took the whole thing apart after he got in so he could get in easier the next time. But sense. why hold on to the oh, freaking lock face? Yeah. That's, have it on that's your person. Just, that's weird. Uh, in his pocket. It's just yeah. in his pocket. Yeah. Not just like, it. oh, I I I have random things in my car from God knows when, you know. Like, oh, this thing in mm -hmm. my purse, I don't want it in my purse, so I throw it in the center console of my car and it mm -hmm. sits there for two weeks and then I'm like, oh God, I need to like put that in the house or throw it away or whatever. Mm -hmm. But Can't not on my your pocket is comfortable. That's weird. That's, that's like the concern here, but you like who it's just does dumb, this? dumb, dumb is what it is. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> yes. oh it's very dumb. It's brutal. Obviously. Do you have a chaser Bizarre. for us, Mom? I do <laughs> have a chaser. And mine is a watch recommendation for the show, um, the docu-series American Nightmare on Netflix, which is, Amanda's nodding, it's really good, and it's oh, yes. a story yes, yes, that yes, I yes. hadn't heard, which so shocks me, because it's from California, and we hear all sorts of crazy shit that happens down in California, because it's just a few hours away, but... I don't want to give any spoilers because it's one of those things where you need to watch it because you have like you watch the first episode and you have an assumption of what's happening. And then you watch the second episode and you're like, OK, now I have a different assumption. And then you get to the end and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> but it's so good. It's so good. So I highly Spoiler. recommend that show. Spoiler alert. Everybody dies. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding yeah it was a great oh, show i oh, yeah. three episodes right and yeah i watched three all three in one sitting it was that good yeah, yeah. so did we because it was one of those like i don't i don't normally like docuseries because they tend to run long and they yep. interview people that are irrelevant i don't care what the victims, dog walkers, hairdressers, tax <laughs> person, how they know them. If they have nothing relevant, don't interview them. Don't care. And that's usually what half of the shows are made up of. Not this one. This one is very good. It's concise. There's no random people that are interviewed repeatedly. And you're like, who is this again? And what do I care? No, this one's, it's a really good story. I mean, it's not a good story, but it's a good series to watch. So yeah. what about you, Declan? So mine is a news article I saw. Um, so Mark Garland is going, uh, returning from a trip from Thailand. He lives in, um, he lives in Britain. 
And he, while he was checking into his flight, he realized there's another Mark Garland on the flight as well. So he walked up to him and introduced himself. And the two are both bald. They're wearing black clothing. They're <laughs> around, roughly the same height. One of them's a little bit taller. They live 34 miles from each other. Oh my They're both bus drivers and sometimes <sighs> would take each other's bus like to and from without like talking to each other. Oh Just a bus my. driver. So. Both of the men have four kids and are both single. And they yeah. actually have a mutual friend that they didn't know. Well. Okay, yeah. wait a second. That's so weird. weird. Were they separated at birth? <laughs> if, if I had two friends that had the same name, those friends well, would know about each other. Right. Well, they right. so one Mark, I can't really distinguish between them because they're they, <laughs> they're so similar. But one of them, it was an old friend from when they were in college, so we hadn't really talked to him in a while. Okay, so but weird. still. I, if I had a friend yeah. named Mark Garland when I was three years old and had never seen them since I was three years old and met somebody new with that exact same name, I'd be like, oh, my God, this is so weird. I used to know somebody with your name. I would look just like you <laughs> for sure yeah. say it. That's wow. Weird. That's like the doppelganger That's episode that weird. we did that you hated. Yeah. I wonder how they met. It's so creepy. <laughs> Uh, they like were sitting at the same restaurant and got served each other's orders or something. Like I wonder. Oh yeah, how that went. <laughs> that'd be wild. <laughs> It'd be funny if they were like at a Starbucks and they said Mark, and they both went <laughs> and they both the reached for it at the same time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> HBO is all over that. Right. <laughs> how about Amanda and David? Do you guys have chasers too? So um, I tried to think of one. I don't really have one that's super relevant, but I do have one from a couple months back. So um, there is a movie. It's another media one. There's a movie called The Reef that I watched recently, which is not a new movie. It's been out for a few years. Um, but the thing about it is the movie is actually based on a true story. It was actually an episode that we covered on our show before about um, three people who get stuck in the middle of the ocean in Australia and are hunted down oh, by a shark yeah. for like multiple days. So there's a movie – and the only survivor of the incident in reality actually hates the movie because it's really not accurate. But there are some pieces that um, pay homage to the original story. So it was a good movie. I won't say that it was something that I would necessarily pay to see. It was free, which is the only way I would have watched it. Um, but it was certainly worth watching if anybody likes watching movies that are based loosely on true stories. Because it's very much um, like a, a tense the whole time. You're kind of on the edge of your seat tense and you feel like you're in the situation with them. So that was my chaser. <laughs> Nice. I like it. David, how about I you? I did not. I'm sorry, Teach. I did not do the homework. Just kidding. Oh, no. I, uh, yeah, did your dog fun. eat it? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so I do have something that follows your story, Jane. And uh, I met my my sister's boyfriend for the first time last night. He's a really good guy. And we got to conversating. And he, has, uh, he also had a podcast. Uh, but I'm not going to say what it is. I'm not going to say his name. He, his dad was Air Force, and uh, he detailed how his life was growing up with his dad. It was very strange. Hmm. Uh, his dad would leave for years at a time, come back. So his dad was dying, uh, I believe it was cirrhosis of the liver, and he was given weeks to live because he was a heavy drinker, heavy smoker. He somehow lived a little longer so they told him well you're it's not gonna be long now buddy he uh told his son hey listen i gotta go somewhere i'll be right back don't worry about it everything's gonna be fine when he returned uh he again continued to live defying the doctor's uh you know orders that he was not going to make it past the very next week so they went and checked him again and they saw that his liver actually grew 15% and that to the point where he could uh, continue living. He can actually, they told him you can drink if you want. I mean, you're okay. You're fine. Wow. Weird. Wow. Very weird. And uh, two weeks after that, the doctor died, which was another strange thing. Mm. 
And uh, the reason why it kind of follows your story, Jay, is because uh, a couple of years after that, he moved to a, an Indian reservation in New Mexico with a girlfriend. And the woman called uh, his son, the guy I met yesterday, and told him that he had died. He was throwing the trash out and he died. And so oh, they're going to uh, basically cremate him the very next day. And uh, since it was like on a res, there, you know how the laws are different. <clears throat> mm -hmm. They could never get a death certificate. They could never get. They did eventually get a uh, bag of his remains, apparently. And uh, so, long Let's story short, water. what's that? Got to test it with water. We did a story where yeah. people. Oh got really? Fake oh remains, yes. Fake ashes. Yeah. Oh, he still has it. I should ask so him about that. Gnarly. I should ask him. If, Take, take a little, a little bit, sample. Water on it. <laughs> yeah. I was saying, happens. get some DNA evidence because it's the same. Well, the Air Force will not uh, release like uh, the benefits to his wife because they will not say his. They will not give his status, his actual status. Oh, oh shit! That's she weird. got a lawyer. She paid seven grand to this lawyer, and they will not release his his actual status. So she cannot get anything mm -hmm. because technically, he's still alive. That's tough. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's and he has scary. mentioned several times that he has, he thinks he had seen his dad watching him. And one time he even saw him at a, at a distance where he could see a tattoo that his dad actually had. And it was the same tattoo. Uh, it was oh, a dude with, with uh, long hair, but he had darkened it, looked just like him. And hmm. as soon as he's trying to go after to see if it's him, the guy takes off. So and right. this happened several times. So it's That's just weird. weird. Oh, wow. Oh, Super I don't weird. like that. <laughs> mm -mm. He's still alive, I think, personally. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like it. Working for the government. Yep. Where? He's a great man now. Yeah. I did not stir my drink enough. <laughs> Amanda's decided she doesn't like the drink after all. I didn't stir it, <laughs> so the top was really watered down and the bottom is really vodka. <laughs> Strong. <laughs> All right. Well, um, would you guys like to tell everyone where to find you? One Nothing, Down the Rabbit Hole, all of those good things. Well, you can find One Nothing anywhere that you get your podcasts. So Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, um, Google for as long as they're living. I think they're dying out soon here. But um, yeah, just search us on Google and all of our directories will pop up. We're on Buzzsprout as well. And we release episodes every other week on Tuesdays. Awesome. And, and down David, the tell hole, us about find it. Yeah, you can find it on Instagram, Facebook, Threads, X, TikTok. Oh my God, I'm everywhere. Uh, definitely mm. look for me. I have about three videos in, a day, every day, consistently, and I try to find the best uh, paranormal stuff, whether it's aliens or ghosts or conspiracy, yeah. whatever it is. It amazes me it where likes. you find your videos. You've got some. Um, incredible stuff that i'm like Where did he, how does he find this man it is tough it's getting tougher because there's a ton of stuff out there that you really have to take a good look at because a lot of it could be fake See if it's real yeah yeah right. and, it, and you know i'm not an expert so i can't really tell you this is real this is not even if it's actually mm -hmm. real i can't say it's actually real i mean it's impossible but the the fake stuff is wow as long as it gets me like the hairs on the back of my neck standing up, mm -hmm. I'm hosting it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, thank you guys again for joining us. It was awesome having you on and lots of fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having yeah. us on. And it was so great to, yeah. to do this and to try this recipe. Thank you for sending the recipe. And I highly advise if you like ginger beer, go try this, but maybe stir yours a little bit mm. first. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> stir it a lot. Yeah. Stir it a little bit. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, nice chatting with everybody. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Declan. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks for joining Bye. us. Bye. 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 Hey, friends. Thank you for supporting our podcast. Please share our show with your brutal and bizarre friends. Give us a boozy follow on your favorite podcast platform. If you're feeling extra generous, we'd appreciate a five-star rating or review as well. But maybe do that sober so all the letters are in the right place. You can find all our contact information in the show notes. 
We love hearing from you, and if you're interested in helping us stock the bar for our future boozy episodes, you can find our Patreon link in the show notes as well.